Well, hello guys, David Vos here. Beautiful day here in Oklahoma. Very cloudy still. Uh, hasn't really actually rained yet today, but it's still cloudy and cool. I well, hope you're having a wonderful day where you are. Well, I want to pick up right where we started last time. I didn't really cover very much in the last video. So I want to cover a lot of information in this video. But what we're talking about then, of course, you've been following the videos, is that there are some different things that we've been looking at at the bottom of the ocean. Looks like cities and roads and so forth. And we've come to the unquestionable acknowledgement that there are vast tunnelways and corridors and something under the ocean. Now, we didn't go down there and look ourselves to see what they are. So that's why we're speculating to what they might be. And what we've basically, I think, realized in all of this, hopefully, at least for myself, is that this is something we haven't been told. We didn't know. And it's not just one of those little things. I mean, when we found out that religion was a hoax, you know, that it was literally designed to keep us away from the truth. You know, religion is what I would call government or rules and regulations. And in other words, do not touch that. What was the first do not that mankind was ever given? Well, according to the ancient scripture, the Holy Scripture, we call it the Holy Scripture, in the beginning, we have a story. And there was this garden that this God, Yahweh, Jehovah, created. And he said, now, I don't want you to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Do not. The Apostle Paul in the epistles in the New Testament says that whole law was a bunch of taste not, touch not, and handle not. He says, but it'll all be used up with the using of it. It's not really spirituality. It's just a bunch of rules. And we can't, our righteousness doesn't come by means of law. So, that's what religion is. We could also describe it as ceremony, rituals. Doing something over and over in a ritual can't get you to heaven. The only thing it possibly could do, if you might imagine, it could do something for you is if there is some deity that has some magical power that could grant you eternal life or could give you something or offer you something. and But you would have to do something for that deity. If you would get down on your knees and worship him, he would give you eternal life or something. So perhaps if that God said, okay, here's the deal. Um, in order to, to get eternal life, I will grant it to you. But you have to get down on your knees. But now, I want you to follow this strict ritual. You have to get baptized. You need to take a wafer. You do a little crossy sign in the, over your head. You mumble some exact words that I'm going to write down. On a, you know, I'm, I'm going to write it out for you how you're supposed to say the prayer. Right? It's a ceremony. Well, obviously, that doesn't make sense. I don't know if we ever stop to think about it, but it doesn't make sense that we could somehow become more righteous. The only thing, you know, by doing something like that, but the only thing it could confer upon you is that somehow or another you'd be pleasing to this God because you've obeyed him. But ostensibly, you can't say that it makes you righteous to dip in some water. Now, the New Testament says precisely this, that that cleansing the outer body is, is of no real eternal benefit. It only benefits you temporarily. And it has nothing to do with spiritual cleanliness. It's only the bodily cleanliness. And that would be the most you could get out of baptism, is getting your body washed, which might be necessary if you get dirty. But as a ritual for eternal life, it means nothing. So these these things that were in the Old Testament were set up as rules and regulations, and that's what we call religion. And then there were types and shadows and buildings and so forth. Well, in looking at the story, when we really begin to open our eyes and realize what the story is all about, because, you know, in kindergarten, we were just children, and we were told, now 
God flies around in yonder heavens and he makes his commandments and we'll, you know, get to go to heaven if we do what he said. You know, this is what we were told. But when you get older and you and you begin to read this, especially with the help of what Jesus told us about, he says, your father is a devil and he's a liar and a murderer. And how the apostles say that this, this can't cleanse you and righteousness doesn't come by law. That that, that that whole thing is done away. That was the bad. That was the accuser. But as an adult, we look at this and we say, well, the only thing that it seems, the only thing that this Yahweh was accomplishing was he was trying to keep us away from becoming like God. That was why he made the law. So everything that's in the Old Testament is literally going to be, if you want to know what the answer is, like what is the reason that there was religion? It was to keep us from the truth. It was the, it was the way to keep us focused on the external instead of listening to the spiritual voice within us. We listen to the external voice and it drones out that spiritual knowing that we have already. The Holy Spirit, which is within us and that teaches us all things. We need no man to teach us. But laws can mesmerize and because with laws, there comes punishment. And therefore, this is the whole system that Yahweh set up was to keep us in bondage by fear, by fear of being punished. So he said in his wrath, he drove them out. And he said, you will not enter in, in his wrath, he said, you will not enter into my rest. And he cursed everybody and he cursed the serpent, which we've discovered is that energy of that carnal, lower carnal nature, the animal kingdom. And there are various animals that represent various natures that are we see in astrology. And so it was this Yahweh that makes the form, and it's the form itself, the physical form of this physical world, that we begin to get controlled by like the wild ravenous beast that controls us, the outer body. And we begin to lose sight of the spiritual truth. So, that was the commandment in a nutshell. All these commandments, the 613 laws, were all basically appendages to the one original law. I don't want you to have knowledge. I don't want you to partake. I don't want you to become like God. And in his wrath, then then therefore comes the punishment. And if you do, I'm going to throw you out. I'm going to curse you. What kind of a deity will curse you? Well, it wouldn't be our father who is love. So, looking at that now as, as adults, mature, grown-ups, in, in, in Christ, I should say, we see the purpose now, if Yahweh was so bent on keeping us away from that knowledge, what do you suppose? What do you suppose that knowledge is? Well, it says right there that we could pump, become like God and have eternal life. That's why Yahweh drove us out of the garden because he said, pre-adventure they put forth their hand and eat from the tree of life and they live forever. He didn't want us to live forever. Why? Well, the obvious truth is, and it's all throughout the Bible, ye are my slaves, saith the Lord. It's in the Sumerian tablets. It's in the Egyptian hieroglyphs. It's all throughout religion. We've been told this stuff so that we never know who we are to hide that little baby Christ in that dark little manger because the little Christ was born in the manger and Herod was after the baby. You see, this, this deity is after your soul. He didn't want you... Because he knows that Christ is going to grow up and reign and, and defeat the works of darkness, defeat his laws and his rules because Christ went to the cross and nailed the law to the cross. And he told the Pharisees, you hypocrites. And he said, your father's the devil and a liar and a murderer. And he says, look, I've come to give you life and that more abundantly. So we go back then to this Old Testament and we see that this religion religious ceremonies, rituals, 
sacrifices. Bring me offerings. Give me your gold. You know, go and go forth in armies. He's the God of war and the God of armies. And he teaches my hand for warfare. And he said, exterminate the nations and make them all get down on their knees and bow down to me. So this is another one of his tactics. Religion, propaganda, that's what the whole, the Torah is instructions. And you will go every seventh day to get your instructions. But you know, you can only, you know, he needs you to have instructions. That's why he takes one day out of the week and, and makes sure that you get those instructions and you go and read the Torah. The other six days, he wants you to be a slave. You know, you must work for six days. And that word in the Hebrew is to become a slave for six days. Do all thy slaving labor. Do thy labor. So, to this day, this government is exactly the same. We go to the court. They got robes. It's a court. The courtyard of the temple. And this man says, you can't do anything unless you get my authority. And I can execute you or place uh, restrictions on you, I can judge you. You're judged in the court. This guy with a robe, right? Black robes because they know that they don't know the truth, right? You go to college and you get uh, a black robe when you graduate. What's that? You know, how, why shouldn't it be white? Well, if you go further and get your doctorate, you get a white robe. Doctors have, scientists have white robes. You haven't gotten your little white robe. Now, what they're saying by that is that, you know, just what we're teaching the peasants is not the truth. We're lying to you. We're keeping you in bondage. You don't actually have to be in bondage to us. This is all a lie. This is all deception. And all you've done, you've spent all these years in school, and it's just a bunch of lies that you've been listening to. And that's why Yahweh says that he, he sends lying spirits to his prophets, that's not to the Lord's prophets, the El El Yon. No, no, no. I'm telling you about Yahweh. And and there was one of his angels that came to Yahweh and, and said, he says, Yahweh, I've got an idea. Let me go down there as a lying spirit and I'll put lying words in the mouth of their prophets and I'll deceive them all. <laughs> and Yahweh says, oh, that'll be a good idea. Do that. And then in Ezekiel, he says, he gave them laws that were not good. And commandments that were not good. That would lead to only death. And so this is the only fulfillment of the law. Is you have to die. You got to pay the uttermost farthing down here. In his kingdom. In his wonderful amazing bondage. That, that we're all living in. Because he made in the second chapter of Genesis. He, he formed Adam from the dust. The elemental dust. And he formed the whole garden. And brought these animals to him. This nature that we're living in, which would keep us from the tree of life, right? The spinning, the, the cherubim, which is the four faces, right, of the cross section of the astrological wheel, the zodiac. And so we're going to go round and round. And it says, I won't pardon your sins into the third and the fourth generation, meaning you're going to come back over and over three or four generations paying for your sins. I will not pardon you. You'll pay the price. So that, why am I going over this? Because you have to get it squarely in your mind that all of this thousands of years we've been under the rule of a hard taskmaster, right? It was bondage and a curse, the Apostle Paul said. And all of this was your shadows and types around and around. The, the Apostle Peter said it's like grass that you cut down and mow it down and Grind it up and make a, a bread and throw it in the fire. And it's consumed. It's a temporary world. It's an endless round and around. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. That's the world we live in. It's not our Father's, our Heavenly Father and our Divine Mother's world. Yes, there's a Divine Mother. You've been lied to. So everything about this world is a lie. Of course, then, if they're going to lie about that, I mean, that's just, we're just discussing religion. One of their big things. Well, nowadays they got way more. They got Hollywood propaganda, right? Propaganda to make you schizophrenic, right? They won't, they make it illegal to have the herbs of the field for the healing of the nations. They don't want you to heal. They want you to die. But so they have you 
believing nonsense and lies to keep you from the truth. But so the whole thing is designed to keep you asleep, to keep you unaware. So, if this whole thing is something we never knew or understood, what then was it that we didn't understand? Well, it isn't just that we're deities, divine beings, that Jesus said, you're, you're gods in the scripture cannot be broken. And they picked up stones to, to uh, execute him for blasphemy. Because he said, you make us thyself equal unto God. And to this day, the churches are still demanding that you never utter those words, ever, ever say, well, I can make my own decisions. <gasps> How blasphemous. You have to obey the reverend or the pope. You know, he's got edicts and paper bulls and, and we're under his, uh, you know, decisions that he made, the decrees and, you know, you have to do everything they say or they'll have a complete mental breakdown and, 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 and if you don't listen to them, They'll do whatever they can. They shun you, murder them if they didn't obey. So obviously they were really, really, really making certain that nobody on this earth ever woke up. So what happens when Jesus comes along? Well, there was a legion of these demonic beings that were controlling. Since this man had a legion of demons. That man, just like all the other people, you know, all these symbols and parables in the New Testament represent the old law covenant and the people that were bound by those laws. They used to take and, and the man was flopping around crazy. They couldn't control him. So they had to bind him with chains. See, that means that you are that man filled with all these wicked ideas and lies. That Yahweh is telling you his demonic lies. And you were bound and chained to a rock. But you weren't bad. You know, everybody was scared of this guy. Because they were like, oh, well, you can't live without laws. We've got to control the world. We can't, oh, we're scared of, of having somebody to become free. We can't let people go free. We've got to build more prisons. And Jesus said, what are you talking about? What are you scared of? Let the man go. And he says, now, Man, I'm going to tell you the truth. No more is there going to be any of this darkness inside of you. We've got to expel these demons, these unclean spirits. What is an unclean spirit? It's lies, accusations, shame, hate. Get rid of the hate. Stop going to war. Stop believing the lies. And so when Jesus came... Those demons, they knew who he was. Because that's that inner spiritual Christ that has power, that sits at the right hand of God. And they saw the light. And they knew the light. They said, we know who you are, Jesus. Have you come to torture us and torment us before our time? Oh, there's a time. There's a certain time, the appointed time, that these wickedness, this darkness has got to go. And so, that represents the fact that there are these ages. Just like you have, we're talking about time. You know, there are 12 hours in a day, 12 months in a year. And there are 12 aeons in the Bible. And so, we're about to go into a new age. And that means that the gods of the old system, Yahweh, the God of darkness, Satan says, I saw Satan fall like lightning, Jesus said. It's time. You're done. Your kingdom's over. And I'm taking away the keys from you, the people who were the administrators of this law, to the Pharisees and scribes. I'm taking away the keys of the kingdom from you. I'm giving it to a people who can produce its fruit. We're going to build a paradise where it's going to have fruit. And some shall go 30-fold and some 60 and some 100-fold. But you, you good-for-nothing steward... What have you done? You you haven't watered it? You haven't taken care of my sheep? I want you to bandage them and go and find them. And, and, and a good shepherd would leave the 99 and go off and try to find that one that strayed. 
But these guys, they were not good shepherds. They were bad stewards. And they didn't take care of the, the sheep. So he, Jesus told Peter, feed my sheep. Take care of them. I love them. Don't ever deny anybody to come unto me. And don't you call that which I have made clean, unclean. Because these Gentiles are not unclean. This is a whole new system. So, if Yahweh's been ruling over this world, then he's got to make sure that we don't see him. Because remember, he's not really our Father in Heaven. He's not really the divine being who can give you eternal life. He's just a big deception. So he's got to lie about everything he does. So, in the ancient esoteric wisdom, all of these writings that are in every country on the face of the earth, they all tell the story because that story was, was put down by our Father in Heaven, by His divine providence. It's written in the stars. We've done video after video of all of this. It's written in the stars. And in every nation, they understood. And so the three astrologers came and they saw the star and they followed it from the east because the heavens, they re we, it revolves. And the sun and the stars, everything rises in the east. And that was that star that marked the beginning of spring. When the sun would rise on the horizon and his kingdom would arise. But in the darkness, in those days, in ancient times, men were under these stewards, this law. And they were under these guards, kept under guard until the day when Christ would be born. So we've all been kept under guard by Yahweh and his demonic rulers that have broken down his garden and not watered it and has not been, you know, shepherding the sheep. So we read then in the Bhagavad Gita about this place called Agartha, and sometimes called Shambhala. As we said yesterday, it is described as tunnels and underground passages. We would probably think, if we hadn't seen it for ourselves, you know, now that the world is, you know, like it says in the book of Daniel, you know, go thy way, O Daniel, till the time of the end. And then knowledge shall be increased. And 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 this these things that were kept secret will be revealed. And the and and there will be a few who will bring the many to righteousness. They'll reveal these truths. It will no longer be sealed. As we've been saying in all of our videos that we're living at the time of the end. So this is all going to get exposed. Well, of course, just like that man with that those legions, I mean, they, they knew they had a time. There was an appointed time that, that, that they were going to have to leave. That man was going to become free. And that's us. We're all going to be free. We're no longer going to be under these bondages, under these laws, under these lies. We're going to become free because the Lord loves us. And so... What what do you suppose would happen if the world started finding out that these, you know, if Yahweh started to find out that we were finding out that he had no authority, that he was a liar? Well, he probably in his wrath would 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 uh, be pretty angry. He'd come down, you know, it would be a war, right? You'd have to kick him out. You have to drag him out kicking and screaming. But of course, that's not up to us. It's a war of, of the sons of light and the sons of darkness. And it's really done by means of truth. See, the truth is absolutely supreme. Every Whatever you say in the name of Jesus Christ, buddy, it's got to be done. Because they, the demons believe and they shudder. And they shudder because of the name of Christ. Because of the authority that you have by virtue of Christ in you. And they cannot withstand the light. They must obey. And the angels obey the word of the Lord. So, what do you think Yahweh can do? Well, the only thing he can do is try to hide it. 
try to hide this truth that's coming, this revealing. We dug books up. So what does he do? He drags his feet and he tries to say, oh, we can't translate. We don't have, uh, you know, the, the churches try to put it down in a dungeon in a monastery somewhere. We don't allow to read that. Don't translate the Bible into the common language. And then if you do finally get it translated, what they do is they they make, they have money, you know, they, they have banks, they can finance propaganda and lies. So they just tell you, oh, don't, don't read it for yourself. You listen to the priest. He'll tell you. Or they'll, they'll, They'll say, oh, we're going to go have a Bible study, but it's really a a book study. Yeah, it's not a Bible study, it's a book study. And the book is filled with propaganda to program your mind to never believe when the truth comes. This is what's happening right now. The truth is, has come into the world, but the world is love darkness rather than light, Jesus said. And when he arrives, will he find faith on earth? Can, can these people wake up? It's been so long, they've been accepting the you know, they're addicted to these terrible things. They prefer this unreality, the darkness. So this is what we have to do as Christians. We have to teach people the truth. So as I'm telling you about this, many of you are saying, oh, this is impossible. There can't be corridors under the ocean. What are they doing down there? I believe in government, Dave. Why the shot? I'm going to get mine tomorrow. They said it's good for us. Well, Huh. This is happening right now because they want to keep you completely, permanently in the dark. Because if you can get through this, if you can stand firm in your faith, the Lord has promised us. We have to have faith to believe, but when we speak the truth, we're, we're going to become free. We'll gain victory by the word of our witnessing, by our testimony. And, uh, so, we're looking at this, these corridors under the earth, and they're saying, hmm, those are just lines, grids, the natural grids. Don't pay any attention to that. So, in the last couple of hundred years, as we're digging up these ancient manuscripts, the church is frantic running around telling their congregations, don't read it. If you do, you're going to hell. That's the occult. Those are witches. We killed those. Don't you be a witch. Oh, that's a wise person. Well, don't be a wise person. Just be stupid and listen to the this guy in a robe, which, as we said, you know, Jesus told us completely and for certain never to, to have a, a, a guy in a robe telling you what to do. Don't call any man your rabbi or your teacher or your reverend or, or certainly not your father or papa or pope. You don't believe them, Jesus said. They're false Christ and false apostles and and they'll say didn't we do many powerful works in thy name he said get away you're far from me i don't know you who are you you're teaching against me you're hurting my family my brothers and sisters but they're frantic telling everybody don't listen so we were talking about madame blavatsky helena blavatsky and we were talking about how she came out with this, all this esoteric wisdom, and she compiled it. Now, some say, oh, there's a lot of plagiarism, and well, you know, a couple of hundred years ago, you, you, you know, there wasn't any computers. So she was, she had a lot of books around her that she was evidently reading and compiling all this information. So she compiled a great deal of information. Ellen White did the same thing. They say she plagiarized. Well, it just means that she wrote information from histories and phrases from the Bible and they didn't have plagiarism laws in those days. And that's how they compile all this information, like a big uh, dictionary. Okay, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but here's the claim of Madame Blavatsky. She says, it's a very interesting story. If you, I don't think we're going to have time to tell the whole story, but it's a very interesting story. Her name wasn't Blavatsky; that was her married name. But um, and she, they only were together a few days or something, and she left him. But she continued to keep that name. I guess many years later, she ended up reuniting with him. They had a child, but for years, I mean, they really didn't have any relationship as such. But her. 
her maiden name was Von Hahn. And it was a royal bloodline up in the, U the Ukraine. So her father was quite important and she probably had some kind of, you know, it's hard when you're reading her story, they don't really tell you a lot of stuff, but she was able to travel all around the world. A lot of times you see these pictures where she's kind of dressed, either she is trying to dress like someone regal, but she had a lot of influence even when she was very young. And she ended up seemingly out of some strange coincidence just being there when a lot of very important people happened to be there as well. There was a time when she was here in America where this uh, spiritualism began. She was right at the forefront of one of these spiritualists that, that you remember back in the New England area, there were up people up there were hearing these uh, unusual tappings and people were claiming that they could, they were psychic and they could uh, make cups levitate and so forth. So this is not something that people are told in the New Age movie. They don't, they don't get the whole story about Madame Blavatsky. But she dabbled around in that. Now, to be fair, she said that the people that were doing that a lot of them were just faking it. And she really didn't believe that they were, it was the dead, you know, talking to people through rappings. She was there and she was investigating it more than anything else. At the very same time that she was there investigating all of this, because like I said, she seems to be everywhere <laughs> at that, in that century and met just about everybody, and very important people. Well, at the very same moment that she happens to be there, and she was actually demonstrating some psychic ability and some uh, clairvoyance and so forth. And there was a guy that was studying all of this name, Alcott. He was also kind of an important man. There were some other individuals there that uh, some were uh, said to be like high up Freemasons that were there. And they were interested in Madame Blavatsky from the very beginning, even before anything, before the stuff that we're going to talk about happened. They seem to be in, enthralled with this woman and she's just a young lady. She claims to be able to do some clairvoyant thing or whatever. And she's going around from place to place. She went to Egypt. She went to, you know, she claims she went to Tibet for a long time. And some people are saying, well, we don't even have any records of some of the places she says she went. Well, we guarantee, I guarantee you, there is a record of, of a lot of places that she did go. I mean, there's no question that before her career is over, she single-handedly, with her and Alcott or some other individuals that were involved in the Freemasons, her her father, her paternal ancestry, they were heavily involved in Freemasonry. Because like I say, we're like a royal bloodline up in Ukraine. And so she ends up being able to just go everywhere. They led her into Tibet in the area in a time when, when they're claiming nor, nobody was ever allowed into Mongolia, but up, up into that area. And yet she went there and, and, you know, had these meetings with these individuals that uh, today has come to be known as uh, these Mahatmas or masters. And she called them, originally all started with these two Mahatmas. One was Moria, Master Moria, and another one was Master Kumi, uh, Hoot Kumi. That was his name. Very odd names and, and, you know, people reading this that are kind of skeptical are saying, well, this is probably just made up. Now, remember guys, I think I've told you this several times. Uh, I spent a few years when I was quite young and I was flipping through a lot of this information. I never really sat down and studied any of this. I, I, I studied Ellen White's information quite heavily because, you know, being from a Jehovah's Witness background, I mean, I wasn't prepared when I was much younger to even start looking at some of this stuff, like New Age stuff, right? We were all told it's the devil. So I didn't really spend a lot of time. But I, I remember, because I lived up in northern Idaho for a long time, and I, w I was always constantly coming across books, New Age books and things like that. So I saw, it's like my mind at that time was sucking in information from everything. It's like a, uh, I don't know how it happened. 
but it seems about, it seems like everything has to do with spiritual matters my mind has absorbed. And I hardly forget stuff when I read it. To this day, I remember just flipping through books. And like I said, I never really read any books. I never went past the sixth grade. I mean, I don't have a high school diploma. I don't have any college degrees. And, but, you know, so I left and was on my own at 15 and, and was a cook in a restaurant. But I, I was completely engrossed in thinking and thought. And I would go to the thrift stores up in northern Idaho. It wasn't any Goodwills like like today and stuff. But, um, well, when I went, I was spent a time in Salt Lake. And so there was a lot of these Desiree bookstores. And I would, I would go in there. But I would constantly be looking for books. At one time, I had something like five, ten thousand books, but I never read any of them. I would simply flip through them, and it was like I sort of kind of sped read them, okay? So I got a lot of information over the years just kind of speed reading and looking at this stuff. Um, well, there's, there's a lot I could go into, and the reason I'm telling you that is because I'm saying, look, I haven't read The Unveiling of Isis or or the secret doctrine, or any of the stuff that she wrote, I I'm familiar with some things. Uh, like I said, I, I'm I'm familiar with a lot of. Um, I've read the Book of Mormon, and I've read um, Christian Science, Mary Baker Eddy, uh, the um, Science and Health, which I would recommend anyone reading. When I finally read that. There was a Christian science meeting, reading room up there in Sandpoint, Idaho, where I lived for some period of time. And one day I walked in there and it was just the most strangest thing in the world. I'd never seen anything like it. And it was all women that would get up and, and they didn't, I don't know if it was like against our religion or whatever to have a man. But it, basically, I guess there was no pastors or, or, or leaders. There were just readers. And it was kind of a position where you got up and read, I guess. I don't really know that much about their hierarchy or what or, or their, their religious views, but I sat through the whole thing and it was just, they were just reading maybe passages from the Bible or, or science and health. I think those two books. And they had what we would call practitioners. So that's where I first came into contact with, I mean, of course, there was a lot of hippies and there were a lot of uh, groups like, communes up there and and i came into contact with some of them there was even um you know nazis the neo-nazis up there and i think i told you guys a couple of run-ins i had with some of them and i and and i was out in the woods and, and come across some communes and had conversations with with some of these individuals i i ended up having conversation with mormon missionaries i ended up uh Talking to a lot of Adventists, so I ended up reading all of Ellen White's, you know, the great controversy and, and all of these books. I read Herbert Armstrong, Herbert W. Armstrong's, uh, books, a lot of his books. So I read some of those kinds of books, but beyond that, I didn't, I've never really read a lot. I never read novels. And like I said, it's, when it comes to books I've read, there's probably 20 or 30 books. I read L. Ron Hubbard's Dianetics and I read different things like that. But one thing I, I can tell you for sure, well, I do remember that there was a bunch of books I would come across that up there because they had all these, you know, spiritual uh, new age kind of religions. And there were a lot of new age bookstores there. And I would go through and just look at these books. And so I ended up finding a few of these uh, new age books that were written by a woman named Elizabeth Clare Prophet. This seemed to be very, very big at that time that I was going through it. I also read um, another book that was written by uh, Shirley MacLaine. That that was a, an amazing op eye-opening book for me too. A simple little book called Out on a Limb. I thought that was an amazing book. And I read one other group of books called um, Carlos Castaneda's Don Juan, and it was a whole series on that. And I think I read one or two of those books. And, of course, there's a whole backstory to that because I ended up be, being befriended by Don Juan, literally Don Juan's student was a shaman who ended up 
taking me in while I spent time up there in northern Idaho. And I became his disciple. And he taught me all that he knew. And they would, um, well, it had a lot to do with herbs and leaving your body and so forth. So I was going through all of these thoughts, and it was stages of this. I mean, I, I started with Adventist stuff and searching and then gotten more and more exposed to stuff. But I'm going to tell you that I began to wake up and realize that every one of these organizations were all financed and created by the same people. And I can give you evidence for that. Here's, here's, here's a little bit of this. You know, I don't know how I can completely prove that to any one of you, but there are if I could remember all the little things, I think there's enough little things that would you would consider evidence to show beyond a doubt that this is all orchestrated. For instance, as a Jehovah's Witness, growing up, and I was thrown out of it when I was 18, you know, and stuff like that, it, I was completely blind. And this is, the, this is the same situation we're all in. We're blind to the, what's right under our noses. But here I was going to a kingdom hall but we refused to say church. It was not a church. We didn't believe in churches. And I didn't think that was strange. Well, I was just a kid. Well, these halls, it, it dawned on me later on, after I years after I left the organization, that's what Masons meet in. Masonic halls. And then I remember in early Jehovah's Witness history, when they were Bible students, and they, were, they weren't even calling themselves Jehovah's Witnesses at that time, um, I remember they were talking about meeting at the halls, not kingdom halls, but the, the, uh, you know how in you, every community have these, uh, Grange halls or something like that, community halls. And they had a lot to do with like the Elks Club and the Rosary Club and these, they were like off branches or offshoots of the, of the Freemasons. And they, those are the, these, these, sort of these elders in, in all of our society, these secret societies that, that in every town that run the, the, the towns, and they would always have these halls. But if they didn't have enough individuals or people there in that city to have their little temple, they would have these halls and they would meet. And so, you know, the truth is, is most Christians don't realize it, but all the Christian churches are all interrelated their hierarchy is all run by someone higher in the pyramid. So, there's no windows in these kingdom halls. They're just dark places where you go in. There's nothing fancy, just a stage, and they would do dramas. And we had a school. I was administered, I was enrolled in the school, the ministerial service. And I thought, well, that's not, yeah, it's a ministerial service. That's, the same word, but it's just an English word for priesthood. And so Jehovah's Witnesses do have a priesthood and, 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 and they do have a suit. The, the black robe, you know, with the white collar, that today has been replaced. And all churches follow it religiously. You have a black suit or dark blue and a white, you have to wear the white um, shirt and, and different colored ties. Now, why would there be different colored ties? Black and white and some color, color of a tie. Well, that is the same principle that you do when you go to university and you get your, you, you, you graduate with a degree, you get a black robe or, you, you know, get out of high school. And that square cap is Saturn. And hanging off that cap is a tassel. And as you go get mid different degrees, you get different colored tassels. That's just like the different colored ties. And if you look at these higher ups, they do know that there is a code with those colors. Now, the grunts down here in the ground, we don't know that, and we wear whatever color tie. I remember as a Jehovah's Witnesses, I was, you know, forced to wear suit and tie and everything, go into the meetings a lot. And I, so I wasn't much of a, you know, I didn't know what I was doing. I, I didn't go out and buy suits. I got them from the thrift store, right? So I'd come in with these weird ties, and they'd be like, what? That's not a appropriate tie you know it's the wrong color or something and i didn't know what was going on but y y you had a certain dress code and all churches do and nobody seems to know why well so in these halls i, I later found out that the that the, the guy who invented Jehovah's witnesses charles taze russell admitted several times that he was a freemason and was involved in zionism and 
knew personally the Rothschilds. But what there's so many different things. Like for instance, there, there, there are Bible translations called the New World Bible translation. Like they used to call it the the, the New Order. We're gonna go into the New World. Or the new order, or the new, like the new order, the new world order, what? See, we, we just said those things. We'd walk up to people and say, oh, do you got the truth? Right, this is the truth. And you had to have papers from congregation to congregation. They, 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 they had a, a, a sort of a, um, this is done by all of the societies. They keep records. And from if you had to move from one congregation to another, you had to take your records and have them sent up by the elders. And those records, you didn't know what was on those records. Only the elders knew. They kept account of everything you did, whether you were faithful to the organization. So you couldn't sort of sneak in and, and you know, it was a, it, they had their own secret little ways of knowing who everybody was and what they were doing. But it never dawned on me that this was not called a religion. They got to be different, right? Well, we're not a religion. What are we? Well, we're a society. Oh, I never thought about that. You got secret societies. You got the, the Freemason society. And guess what? Madame Blavatsky created her and Alcott and a couple of others created this theosophical society right around the same time that Russell started Jehovah's Witnesses. Ellen White just like Mary Baker, well, just like uh, Madame Blavatsky, was married to some very powerful Freemason. You know, Mister Kellogg, uh, making uh, these uh, these uh, sanitariums, right? This is what Christian Science did: making sanitariums and 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 the Theosophical Society making sanitariums. There were high up individuals who were making these societies everywhere. And they would have um, regions and districts over their societies. There's all kinds of... You, there's absolutely no way, once you see all the different words that are inter interchanged between these all these different societies, there's no way, at, at some point you realize that it's kind of like looking at, at satellite pictures of, under the ocean and you see all these lines of symmetrical and right angles and you know that this is not just natural. And so the above ground, we're looking at all of these kind of like passageways between, you know, like organizations, kind of like cities, kind of like contrived organizations, societies, in which they would group and gather all the people of the world and mind wash them, brainwash them. Whether it was you were either raised in the uh, the Baptist or the Lutheran or the Buddhist or the Catholic or the Jehovah's Witness or the Mormon or whatever, you're all raised in something. And you're all wearing little black robes and you're all just out of some crazy, you know, monotonous uh, commandment. We're told we have to go every Sunday to this building and get our instructions. So, from, you know, hundreds of years ago, I mean, back in the 15th century and stuff, you had all these, what we call organizations or societies. And they used these specific words, and they would have branches, they would start another charter or another branch, and they would always meet in lodges or halls. This is lingo. They have a jurisdiction. It's kind of like, the same lingo that was that they use sometimes in the court system, you know, you have jurisdiction in 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 police stations and stuff like this. Well, so all of these words, if you go and take a look at the Theosophical Society, they use all the same words that the Watchtower and Bible and Tract Society use. They have branches, they have regions, they have districts. And then they incorporate and they do all of these different things and they never use, this is why Jehovah's Witnesses never call themselves a church because they were specifically created. I mean, some of these other, you know, churches like the Catholic Church and the Baptist and these, 
They they were started originally. They broke off Christianity, and they kind of held to some of the same lingo. They still talk about church and 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 faith and stuff like this. But the newer groups, organizations started in the last couple hundred years, all of them were financed and started by the same individuals. You can find absolute proof of this. So, who then really started all these groups and organizations and charters and branches of these other organizations that were sort of tiers under the pyramid system, this one world system, this new order that they were creating in the last couple of hundred years with Zionism and the protocols of Zion and, 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 and the creation of the state of Israel. Well, they knew they couldn't just voila, do stuff. They had to get us ready. They had to prepare for the fact that we were going to start waking up when people got knowledge and technology and we had uh, typewriters and access to libraries and books. We were going to learn. So they had to have a way to get us all into these organizations that would have absolute control and we would all be conformed and we would never wake up. This was one of their methods. They also used Hollywood and the radio and the, and, and the music and, and the lyrics and every, there's so much going on around you that you have no idea. The food, the poisons in the air. So, but way back before all these organizations, like Job's Witnesses certainly weren't the first. I mean, Charles Taze Russell started his organization, you know, in 1864 or 75 or something. Okay, that's exactly right around the same time that um, the unveiling of ISIS was, was published and and they started, I think it was in 1875 that they started their first Theosophical Society. So the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society was probably incorporated or, or created at about the same time. And they began to publish. It became a publishing house to make tracts, to, to, to put tracts all over the world to get everybody to go back to the idea that Jehovah was the only God. And you had to have this priesthood and we had to all wear these black robes with the white shirts, you know, in a tie. And we all had to obey our elders. And so it was propaganda. And they had various kinds of propaganda for various kinds of people. And for the higher up that would be taught little higher truths, they would have a little higher up branches. So back when they, when they so originally now, remember, the knights, this goes back to the Fisher Kings and it goes back to Christ. And the early Christians. But as time went on, the Catholic Church massacred them. And these massacres continued on until um, 1306 or something in France. On Friday the 13th, they massacred all of the Templars. Well, they went underground. They came back up, back up as Rosicrucians. We have Francis Bacon, who... Uh, had to kind of be secret because they would they would crucify you they would they didn't see they were they were trying to expose all the darkness in the Catholic teachings and so the Catholics would go in and have uh, inquisitions and murder everybody the Waldensians was a big purge when they did the Waldensian Inquisition and the Spanish Inquisition so they went down underground they became the Knights Templars to protect the Holy Grail well. The Jesuits formed, just like the good guys created the Constitution of the United States of America. There were good organizations that had gone underground so that they didn't die and this truth wouldn't be snuffed out. They To preserve the truth. They did everything they could to, to preserve the truth by making paintings and, and artwork and, uh, you know, ex making libraries and trying to have inventions like, typewriters to publish the word of God. On the Conversely, the bad guys, they created the Jesuits 
the Jesuit order, and they went forth and their primary goal was to destroy the Knights Templars. And they did it by infiltrating them and creating the Illuminati. And they had this plan. The plan was always to establish again this one world government under Yahweh, under the, the, the forces of the of the bestial system of government that was run by those beings, those the devil and his angels that fell and that were under the ground and they were having us as slaves. But the world was going to wake up and we were going to find out the truth. So they had to keep us down. So in the last couple hundred years, they come out with Ellen White and groups that made these organizations and they placed them all over the world. So the Theosophical Society was one of the very first and it attracted very powerful people right off the bat. So initially, this young woman, she says that there was this great master, these two masters that sent her letters. And there's some, they, they, they were never allowed to publish the letters. But later after Madame Blavatsky died, they ended up publishing them. They're very strange letters. They were like printed in very strange calligraphy or something. And they had all this amazing information. The reason that they were made was because there was a guy named Wilhelm Hube Schleider, Schleiden or something. Anyways, a very powerful person in Germany, in the Bavarian area that we're always talking about. This is that, remember it's, it's Bavaria that, that they created the Illuminati. And it was in this area that we ended up not very long, a few years later, having World War I. And there was a guy named Wilhelm there, who was the Wilhelm II, who was the bastard child of Queen Victoria and Rothschild. Because you see, the Rothschilds ended, ended up having nine children with Queen Victoria. And those kids went in and took positions of power all around the world. One of which was Wilhelm II that went to Germany there in the Bavarian area and started World War I. It was part of the plan. Now, they named this institute, Wilhelm Institute, after this man. And the Wilhelm Institute is where they created the eugenics. This is way back at world, starting with World War I. Hitler didn't start this. He was also, Hitler was a bastard child of Queen Victoria, a, a grandson, and the Rothschilds. He was one of the, a grandchild of, of Nathan Rothschild. And so was this Wilhelm too. And so this was all completely planned. And so this individual creates this institution of learning where they study eugenics, how to poison people, where they first started working towards building computers so they could con completely map the world and control everyone. And meanwhile, this is where they created the Illuminati with Adam Wessap in 1776 as a counter juxtaposition to the Constitution of the United States created by Washington, who were true Freemasons that go all the way back to the Fisher Kings. But the Illuminati infiltrated all of these groups and they infiltrated the Rosicrucians that came up in that Bavarian area and created the Illuminati. And this institute, the Wilhelm Institute, who, by the way, Einstein was a director of. I mean, you don't think he knew something bad was going on there? Oh, he didn't know, Dave. <laughs> He was a good guy, right? He's just making uh, science, right? Advancing us to scientific heights. No, he made a nuclear bomb and it was for what? Violence and death and to murder and to plague mankind. Why do I know that? Because they had already been working on eugenics at that place. And that was where they invented all of these amazing things and philosophies. And that is the place where these individuals ended up coming up with, you know, Freudism and Darwinism and, and the, the, the evolution as we are taught in higher learning with the black robes and, and the rationalism and the dossiers and the kind of doctors that use a knife 
and commit abortions. That the original physicians, like Luke was a physician, used to swear, you know, the Hippocratic Oath, that they would do no harm, would not use a knife, nor commit any abortions or use drugs. And it was called sorcery when you did that. And this is what the Bible warns us of. So I'm, I'm well over an hour, and I'm just now getting into the information that I wanted to tell you about. So I'll continue on for a few minutes, but we're going to have to go into another video for tomorrow. But let me continue on and finish my thought here, uh, maybe for about five or ten minutes, because there's some interesting information that I think you probably want to hear. Because, um, so this, this uh, Wilhelm is also, not only is it where the Bavarian Illuminati was created, in this Bavarian area there in Germany, but it's also where the Theosophical Society was created, a new chapter or charter in this jurisdiction. This lodge or society was created. I mean, the first one was in 1875 over here by this Alcott in, in, um, in America. But then one chapter just kept, they just kept making them all over. And this was one of the very first ones. It was created in Germany in this area by this guy named Wilhelm. And then later on, a guy named Steiner, you know, came along and took over that organization after Madame Blavatsky left. But there was all these people that came in. Now, it's been sort of surmised that these two people that came originally to Madame Blavatsky and said, look, we're these masters. We come from Shambhala, from under the ground, in the corridors, under the sea. And there's an entrance in the Himalayan mountains. And we, we're we down there and we're going to bring about the new world order now. And so we've chosen you, oh, Madame Blavatsky. And oh, you too, Charles Days Russell. And oh, you too, Ellen White. And oh, yeah, you. And they chose them all. And they, and they financed them. Well, one of the biggest ones is the New Age movement, the, one of the largest modern religions, basically. A religion that's not like the old religions, like the Jehovah's Witnesses are not like other Christians, like Mormons are not like other Christians, like Christian science was doing the same, having the same things going on, same ideas, new concepts, all to confuse and to keep people in confusion and to steer them back to the direction of Jehovah and the law all over again. But, you see, they couldn't hide the fact that this original esoteric wisdom, they wanted to make people think that they were being taught all this great wisdom, but they were concentrating on candles and yoga positions that didn't really exist according to the real truth. So a lot of this New Age stuff was based on Buddhism, but not based on original esoteric wisdom from the Bhagavad Gita. But based on this guy named Alcott, who teamed up with um, other very powerful Freemasons and created another society called the Theosophical Society and other societies that we've talked about, like Jehovah's Witnesses, the Watchtower and Bible Tract Society, you know, waiting for the new order, the new world order that they're patiently waiting for. So these two guys, the Master Moria and Master uh, Hoot Kumi turns out are literally just individuals going by pseudonames. It was members of the great Illuminati, the Jesuit priests that have orders from individuals that live under the ground. That was true. They exposed a great deal of information. There were truths coming out of these organizations. But all of these truths were designed to preempt the real truth. Because they knew we were going to find out these truths. These books were being unearthed. Ancient wisdom, Babylonian tablets, right? Esoteric, you know, the, the, the hieroglyphs were being deciphered. People had access to computers and knowledge like myself, and we could find out. We could look at satellite images of these tunnels. So they're going to have to preempt all of this. So they interpret all this information with a twist. You turn the cross upside down and voila, now you're told, you're telling people that 
that you're really supposed to be worshipping down there at the bottom of the wheel, this god of with horns. And oh, by the way, he's upside down and he's uh, half male and half female and he's he's a god of law. <laughs> he's the law giver. And we're going to build a kingdom based on the law and go back to the age of Aquarius down there under the under the power of Saturn in the darkness. And so this unsuspecting poor Ellen White gets married by this powerful Freemason is told to write down all this stuff because they they did this in Germany they did this and all around the world they would take people that were able to 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 they had the the the, the um wherewithal and the mental clarity to be able to sit down I mean literally it ruined this woman's life Madame Blavatsky died young she ended up becoming very very sick she was very overweight because she sat around all the time in her in her study just writing Writing, writing, compiling, compiling these huge mass of information and then voila, the uh, very powerful people of the world financed and published all of her work. And, and these powerful people like uh, Steiner, right, and, and Alcott and, and you know, later on, we haven't even got to Hitler, people that were in the Theosophical Society, remember they used the swastika, Madame Blavatsky used it right on her literature. And it, and, and it was right there in Germany where all this got started. The Theosophical Society, hand in hand as one of the umbrella organizations under the Great Pyramid of the Jesuit priests. And another one is, yes, you guessed it, Jehovah's Witnesses and all the others. Under the umbrella of these liars that were being completely deceived and lied to by very powerful emissaries of the dark forces that live under the ground. And so if you look at Theosophical Society teachings, you'll find they explain all of it. They tell you all about Agartha and the Shambhala and the tunnels under the ground and, the, and, and how they don't allow humans down there because the knowledge is just too much. So you see, if you'd be tempted to look at all of this and say, oh, it was enlightenment and, and it was the gods that came down and and told, but you look into it and you find out that, that it was the same individuals pretending to be masters. Think about what they, what they invented, the idea they came up with. The Great White Brotherhood? Really? Remember what I told you about that, that book I ran across by Elizabeth Clare Prophet? Well, I remember thumbing through that book. You know, I didn't really read any of them, just sort of sped read them. Sometimes I thought I could just sort of just take a look at it and kind of know what was in there. I learned so much just, just flipping through the, the pages. And I noticed that this Elizabeth Claire, Claire Prophet, at that time I had no idea what was going on, but she was talking about all this stuff about Moria, El Moria, you know, or the, the Master Moria. And and she, she mentioned all these different names that they were part of this Master White Brotherhood. I think, where is she getting this stuff? Well, I didn't know it at the time, but these were all names, pseudonames. Elizabeth Clare Prophet was being controlled by. These were individuals that were had access. Elizabeth Clare, or I should say, Madame Blavatsky had access to a underground tunnel that went down in the Himalayas. She went to Tibet and lived for some time. They ended up to, in Sri Lanka, creating an institute, and 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 and, and you know the Theosophical societies were established all over the world. And so now the New Age movement is no longer Buddhism. It's just these teachings that these guys have twisted. Telling everybody to sit in a yoga position going, oh, I'm beating their head up against the wall. Coming over here and telling Christianity that all you got to do is go to church and be obedient and you'll be fine. Get the shot in the arm. It's all propaganda. I can prove it. And I'm going to need some time to do that. So I'll go ahead and go further into this. And we're going to do at least two or three more videos on this. We've got to go through all the, we're not even halfway through Madame Blavatsky and what happened over there with the Wilhelm Institute and the Theosophical Society and the Watchtower Society and all these other societies and the, and the, and how they took over the Freemasons and murdered Joseph Smith, who was one of the last Freemasons after, um, 
Francis Bacon ended up leaving this world and that ancient wisdom was handed on to a, a small group of individuals that, that came to America and created the Constitution of the United States. And the Smith family was directly in line and initiated by those original founding fathers. A lot of people don't realize it, but Joseph Smith started in New York, not in Salt Lake City, and around Philadelphia and Boston. So, anyway, we'll, there's so much to cover, but we got to get through all of that, and then we got to get through what happened with Hitler, because, you know, this is now we're just, we're in World War I, right, with the Wilhelm II. And then the Wilhelm Institute continues on, and Einstein and the bomb and World War II, and then Nazi Germany, and yes, Antarctica. And I promised you that I would tell you, and I'm way over an hour, but I promised you I would tell you what the, the South Antarctic continent is for. And I'm just going to tell you flat out right now before I leave, and then we'll conclude this video, and we'll explain it more in the next, in the next few videos. But the South American continent is the South Pole where there is a vortice or a wormhole that you can literally leave through a wormhole and go onto another dimension or a, the... Uh, we'll leave it at that, okay? The North Pole has the same little wormhole that our government is now aware of these UFOs or extraterrestrial ships are coming in and out from the South Pole and that is why that area down there in, in the, the Antarctic is so important to them and no one can go down there because there are ships coming and going and we'll talk about that in, in a coming video as to where they're going and what they're doing but they're hauling away our resources but anyway I gotta stop there because we're completely well, 15 minutes over so we'll pick it up there right where we left off tomorrow and tomorrow I will try very hard to dispense with any stuff that's not necessary. We'll get right into where we left off here and just assume that only people who have watched this video are going to be watching the next one, I guess. And and for those who get in on it and don't know what's going on, of course, you'll have to go back to the other videos. But anyway, we'll see you tomorrow, guys. Have a good one.